Okay, hello everyone. So hello. Welcome. Good morning. Tashi mm -hmm. Delik, welcome and salutations wherever you're from. And today mm -hmm. we have very, very special guests. We have Kandro Dawa Droma, Dakini Kandro Dawa Droma from Singapore. And she'll be sharing with us a lot of fascinating realizations, information, tips on mind and life dharma practice very practical uh tools today so we'll be covering a lot on human life today mm -hmm. and yes kandroma thank you so much for doing this much kindness thank you yeah so yes. first of all um to introduce to the the viewer the audience mm -hmm. would you like to tell us a bit more a little bit of the, the background of your dharma practice um, my practice is, I would say, is very personal. Um, I don't really, from where I am, we're in the same country. <laughs> I don't actually visit any centers and, uh, or temples, that sort. I take my practice just very simply at home, my meditational practice and things like that. So, yeah. As far as um, that part of, in terms of this, um, I think a lot of people, I have received a lot of messages. People will ask me, where do you go? Uh, or do you go to any center in Singapore? And things like that. I'm like, no, actually, no. My only center is here. Yes. That's <laughs> yep. Yeah. And um, would you like to tell us a bit more, elaborate a bit more about the name, the title you have, Kandro Dawa Droma? Ah. Interesting. This question. This question. <laughs> well, actually, I get that question a lot, and I have never really been, um, how would I say that, addressing that. I just never really see a point of um, elaborating on that. But um, here's the thing with the title Kandro, it actually means Dukini, and that um, with the word Dawa um, people get mistaken and might think that, um, you know, that I am a Tibetan, you know, but uh, that is actually the name that I was initiated into. So then I was given this name. Um, so with, uh, well, a lot of people ask me, I think that is where you're trying to go about, you know, this Kandra, this Kandra thing, this Dakini thing. Uh, where it comes from, how it comes about, and et cetera, et cetera. Basically, uh, some people tell me, Rinpoche is, and they told me that they say, you're a Dakini, and I was clueless. I have no idea what they're talking about. They say, you're a Dakini. I said, what is that? So they tried to briefly explain to me what that is. And I said, okay, and I maybe because of language barrier i don't quite understand so then i came back and i google i said okay that's interesting and then i just never really how would i say that uh, resonated with that until another time when i was sitting down and i was having a conversation with another rinpoche then we were just talking about life and everything else in between and then we discussed and then he talked about you know how uh, women are and how difficult it is to be a woman because of the childbirth that you know women have to go through etc and I said I don't uh, remember I said as far as I'm concerned my mom always have been saying that she had the easiest birth with me and it was like how is that so I said she said there is no pain no nothing wow, said, painless. How's this? How's this? Mm. <laughs> and she's like uh and, and 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 he was like uh can you tell me more and then i said yeah she she was pregnant with me and that um <clears throat> uh she felt pain she went to the hospital and before she could even enter the hospital basically she was outside the hospital at the grand entrance and she just couldn't hold it anymore and she, she gave birth to me outside and i oh. came out yeah, and I came out in the water bag. Right. Yes. So, but usually when we uh, 
uh, when there is a birth, um, wow. the, the child comes out, just the body will come out. But she said, I just slip right out together with the water bag. And, and it was painless and it was so easy. It was just a flush and then it just came out. And then he was like, ah, now I know why you are the way you are. I was like, what do you mean by that? Then he says, you sure you really don't know? I said, I have no clue. I just thought, okay, a birth is a birth. Okay, I come out in a water bag. So, because we live in a water bag for nine months. So what's so special about that? Then he told me that in the Tibetan culture, uh, when somebody can uh, basically come into the world, is the birth is in such a manner, then if it's a man, then they will usually be given the title called um, a tulku. Tulku. You know, yeah, a tulku. Okay. And that um, because I am a woman, so of course, um, you know, uh, in Mandarin, because we communicated in Mandarin, then he said that he can only uh, just say, you know, it's which means someone who has an enlightened activity in the previous life and then taken rebirth again. So I said, oh, okay. Yeah. And I said, I, I thought that's very common. And he says, no, it's not. It's in the Tibetan culture, such birth is viol- very highly regarded. I said, okay. And then I went to Google <laughs> and I actually found out, oh, okay, it's actually not common. In fact, it's pretty rare. It's very rare. I don't know one in how many uh, thousands or I don't know how many. Yeah, that would actually have, um, you know, the birth that actually happened this way. So then it says, then because of that, then as a, a, a woman, a, a lady, if, you know, when we become as a, a female, then we would sometimes call them a dakini. Yes. Yeah, because a dakini, there's many different kind of definition. Some is by birth from a uh, religious family, some of which is, you know, um, activity from the previous life, and some is because they married into that, um, which means that their husband is um, a, a spiritual being. Yeah. So then, um, yeah. So then he explained that to me, and I was like, uh, okay. And still, I, because I am very, maybe you can call that stubborn. I don't really just take things as it is. You can call me that and that's fine. I don't know what it means. I Google, (laughs) I know the meaning. And then I just continue with my, with my practice and everything. And of course, as the time goes by and along the practice, then I start more and more starts to surface and I start to, you know, see a lot more things while in my practice. Then, then I start to, okay, I accept it. So previously, when people tell me, I'm just, okay. It's just like, to me, it's like Mr. and Mrs. Miss. Yeah, that kind of title. So I've never really felt a very high regard of, oh, you can't rule, yeah. like anything. So yeah. this was much later on in your adult life, like earlier, or was yes. it an earlier recognition, like early on? Mm, no, it was, uh, it was actually much later. It was actually much later. But um, ever since... I was a little child. I always have um, see things in a very different manner. And I would say a lot of things that will sometimes throw a doubt off. And that, um, yeah. So when, yeah, so, so that has always been my life. And to sort of, I don't know how you call that, but I don't want to make it such a cliche. But, uh, you know, just to be able to anticipate things in a, ahead of time. Right. Yeah. Or like Is very clear vision. Clairvo- clairvoyance or intuition, yeah. some kind of divination, divine yeah. eye. maybe. Very great detail. And after which that thing will happen in accordance to the way I, I have seen it. Right. So, and I always will tell. <clears throat> I will always tell my grandmother, she says, ah, you are a child. You know, they never really take too much uh, regard into that. I said, okay. So I grew up with all this thing and, and then I've always had dreams ever since I was a child that I was, I was always flying in my dream, (laughs) always flying. (laughs) Sky goer. (laughs) Yeah, always flying. And then I will always ask, 
And then my grandma will always say, where do you want to fly to? You want to go on a holiday? You want to go on an airplane? She thought I was hinting. I said, no, no. <laughs> Just maybe you're thinking too much about, you know, being in an airplane. I said, okay, maybe. So, yeah, mm -hmm. so it has always been brushed away. And um, uh, the earlier part of my um, childhood, uh, where I grew up with my grandma and all that, although we are Buddhist, but um, just very general, you know, ritual sort. Nothing too deep. So I guess that's the reason why there hasn't been, you know, much of an, uh, what, we, what do we call that, that, you know, uh, attention to that. To that, I guess it would have been different if you know I was um, born in maybe uh, of a different culture. Then they would probably would say more. But yeah, so I grew up not knowing what it was and everything. So until when I move on to much later in my adult life, and when I get into contact with others, uh, when I met Rinpoche's, when I found out about all these things, and of course, you know, <clears throat> it gave me some answers. So, because when I try to Google and I get some definition of what a dakini is, then I relate to my childhood, to my dreams, to my visions. Then I kind of, um, it kind of makes sense, but I have never really have a very strong grasping towards that because I just still thought, you know, wow, I, 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 I can't be that way. I have, you know, my, 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 my life in the materialistic world or the mundane world, we call that. And so, yeah, and then, um, but of course, um, ever since I was being called that, uh, something that there's a, there's a shift in my practice. Right. Then it starts to go towards another direction and stuff. And then I would call that evidence to make me zipped up and accepted. So, yeah, that's, that's what it is. Wow. Yeah. Beautiful sharing. <laughs> I don't now think, it's out. <laughs> I don't think now both, it's out. I don't think both you and I would have expected such a profound sharing. And um, the, 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 quote, the, the thirst has been quenched for a lot of people. <laughs> probably, probably, hopefully. I've been getting a lot of messages and some are quite persistent and said, Did you receive? Why are you not telling me? Why? Tell me, tell me, you know, that kind of thing. So I've never really responded. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think it's really interesting also. I think even um, for myself, I think since the first six, seven years especially, sometimes you can have certain memories, certain mm. kinds of, 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 of certain time, certain places, and even certain kinds of familiarity or certain inclination. You know, mm -hmm. I was very inclined towards Tibet from a very, very young age. And mm -hmm. You know, so a lot of these things, very interesting. I think even people who are watching or the viewers, um, for those who are acquainted with some kind of meditative practices or even reflection, to try to recall as much as possible going back, you know, through the years, mm. especially the first six, seven years, very formative years of memory. And we can try to recollect and uh, certain things can be quite, beneficial in some way but we will get more into this later uh as as, as the talk goes on as well so mm -hmm. yeah thanks for sharing that um so today we are speaking about precious human life and mm -hmm. perfect human rebirth or how to make a meaningful life a purposeful life and mm -hmm. so yeah so the first kind of question or first idea we can think around is how can we actually maximize our fullest potential in life Quite general. Mm. I think a lot of people are putting a lot of um, focus in the future. A good number of them placing it in the past. When you dwell in the past, that is something whereby you can't change. Then they always bring that up to sort of like um, use that as a reason of the way they are or the reason why they are suffering. If we talk about this precious human life 
in terms of Buddhism, then we know, you know, it's life is suffering. Yeah, so I won't go too deep into that, yeah, but when we talk about life is suffering, it truly is. But then again, it's if we want to talk about maximizing our life and how to live and have a happy life, then there are certain things that we need to remove and we need to shift. So when I talk about shifting, I think that would be the focus part. In the, I would say in the Western world, it is very common that, you know, when something goes wrong, they blame it on their childhood. I had a terrible childhood. I had a traumatic childhood. My mother was this way. My father was that way. But you have already grown, haven't you? Right. For you to get to where you are, for you to be able to say that and use that as a reason, which means that your intellect is, you have a um, good enough intellect to differentiate between things. So if you are able to use that to your advantage as a reason for your wrongdoings, then you will have the basic common sense of judging what is right and what is wrong before attempting something. Okay? So one problem of which is that, because when you ask me about how to maximize the life, then we must first see our mistake. Then we can make it more colorful. So then now I'm talking about the mistakes that general human being make. Yeah. So then one is to always be living in the past, to always be talking about the past. Then you will not be able to move on. Slowly, somehow or another, it becomes habitual. Yeah, I'm this way because I was brought up this way. Your childhood was during that time and after which you are not an adult. But because... Yes, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't deny the fact that, you know, there is sometimes um, maybe some very traumatic kind of experiences that has been going on and stuff like that. But if you're able to carry on in your adulthood and move on and you make friends, which means that, you know, within here, yeah, within your mind stream, there is still some strength. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to survive through the years after that. Yeah. So that is on the past on the past side and on the future side then we have um uh how would i say that people always doing something but this i'm just talking on the uh, context of the dharma just based on uh, people that is um, around me conversations that i have heard they will always said i'm going to do this 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 and that because then you know this has very good merit and I'm going to have a better life. They base whatever they're doing right now with a purpose of something of a time that they don't even know whether if it exists. How it, will, how it will actually exist. They said, okay, I'm going to do this and that for my future life. I'm going to do, I'm going to go, you know, fish liberation. I'm going to set this animal free. I'm going to do this and that for that. Then it becomes kind of like um, we bluntly will say it's kind of like a goal or, or a direction, but in other words, it's kind of like a trade off, isn't it? So, if there's no beneficial for you in your future life, then this X probably is not something that you take so, you know, that, that you will very enthusiastically do it. So, yeah. I think in order to have a a meaningful life, I would say, is to just simply living in the present. The life itself, what we are seeing with our eyes in this materialistic world, as big and as vast as this planet might be, it is still not bigger than the world within yourself. That is a huge world to explore. And if you are able to tune this inner world, to, I think if I want to say, you know, to uh, stability and, you know, like, and, and things like that, maybe it is difficult for some people to, to sort of like 
understand is that oh, it's a very tough process. But just in general, that if you are able to tune your inner world to a level whereby you know you are just simply being, then there really isn't much that you know you have to worry about the outside world. It is not about I have to do this to make my world beautiful, or I have to do this to live my world to the fullest. The world is the world. It is constantly moving. It is constantly moving. What you need to do is to step back because the, that thing on the outside is not going to stop moving. It is constantly moving. And because of its constant movement, therefore it has uh, what we, we call that an effect on you. If you pay attention so much to the movement, there is no stability in the mind. You're just constantly moving like this. Your emotions shift all the time. Your thinking shift all the time. And when all these things just keep shifting, then we would say, then, you know, where is the peace? That's why it's very important to focus inward and you look inward. When you have stabilized your inner world to, an, to, um, to a certain extent, then it, it doesn't matter how the outside world is. You can't change the world in that sense that the world is big. But if you change your inner world, then how you perceive the outside world, it doesn't matter how they are. It's just like you putting, you're wearing a glasses that is tinted. It is tinted in blue. And when you looked out, everything will have a tint of blue. Right? So when you fix your inner world, it is just like this tint. It doesn't matter how crazy it is. You will just see things through this so-called tint. Of that way if you are very how would I um, peaceful and calm and have a um, and have a very stable mindset within yourself then you perceive the world that way as well some people might, might be barking at you be really nasty towards you but you just said that is just what it is you know just simply being there is no need to search all the things from outside Search from within, know how you actually function, work towards that, build on that, and that's all you need to do. Because if you go out searching, the search will never ever end because everything is always constantly moving and changing. Here you hold on to, it's stable and that's all that matters. Very profound, <laughs> and it's it's almost like um, it's like because the, the in our condition existence, it's almost like the monkey mind isn't it, swinging from tree to tree. It's mm -hmm. either towards um, grasping on towards the past or anticipation towards the future, and then mm -hmm. the idea of the being in momentariness in an unfindable present is mm. almost not something we kind of take advantage of in some ways or we are not as aware or trained mm. that way. So, you know, it's, it's a, it's a very interesting also you mentioned about the external world. So in terms of, if we are very attached to the or averted to the eight worldly concerns, you know, like loss and gain, praise and blame and all that, it's mm -hmm. to do with some kind of external self-gratification in a sense. Mm -hmm. You know, the external world has something which pleases us, but mm -hmm. since things are not as it appears to be, then we, it's a mistaken identity in, in mm -hmm. some sense, confusion back to ignorance. So I think that's a very important point that you manage to tie that up of being in the momentariness at the same time towards uh, not having the self-grasping towards things outside of us because mm -hmm. that internal transformation. And, yep. and also you mentioned the cognition as well of how we view things mm -hmm. and how to perceive things as they are. And I think mm -hmm. that's really very important. You know, and uh, mm -hmm. it reminds me as well, since I was very young and throughout, even until my life now, um, 
people, some people always think that I analyze too much or to them it's over analysis. But to mm-hmm. me, over analysis is a point where the individual might feel more over anxious. But to me, I never felt over anxious in a sense because analysis and investigation to me was very natural. Mm-hmm. And then when I started to get into astrology and I started to understand certain conditions, certain things which you can see, certain qualities brought on from previous conditions, not from this life. And I thought, oh, actually having analytical tool is not as bad as what people put it out to be, you know. Mm-hmm. Because to, to be able to investigate things as they are, we require a certain kind of analytical mind. So mm-hmm. I think that's really important, as you mentioned, the view. So uh, to tie this up, um, which the next question also, or rather the next topic of discussion within this is about, the idea of um, acknowledging rebirth, for example, or Hmm. even future lives, like how can this be important and how can it also at the same time be dangerous in order to, for some people to either anticipate the future life, which you you did mention, maybe we can broaden up, or people Hmm. who like constantly searching like, oh, in the past is this and that and, you know, too caught up. In the past life, yeah. Um, you see, when we th- when we talk about life, when we live in the present, I tell you a very. Um, let me insert a little story. I, I tend to I like to do that. A friend of mine. This lady, she has been, she's not from, she's not local and she's been here for about almost 20 years. In the neighborhood that she lived in, she has always visited this market with her husband. And that, um, but of, sorry, but it's often the, the, the husband that is leading the way and she just follow. And so one day she told her husband, she said, um, I'm going to go to this market and get some things. And uh, to my husband, I said, you want me to come with you? And she said, no, it's fine. She went there. That is the neighborhood she's been living for almost 20 years. She lost her way in the market. When she got to the complex, she doesn't know which way to go in which staircase. Then it goes to show because people, when you are living your life, we are all moving. Irregardless how You know, the body is made in in a way whereby you would just go through it. But how much attention or or awareness you put into doing something, that's the difference. Of a route that she took for almost 20 years, she lost track of how it is supposed to be going. So this is, I'm just trying to move back to the previous topic and just just tie that up. And to, to basically say the importance of being aware and to be present. Otherwise, you're just living a zombie life. Zombie moves. Oh. They move. But the direction where they're moving, there isn't really much. You know, there is no clear sense of direction where they're moving. So then it is very important that we keep our state of mind present. Of course, you know, like you said, the monkey mind. We're drinking a cup of water, but processing what is something. What's the next question I'm going to ask her? <laughs> or you know or drinking a cup of tea what am i going to do this afternoon what i'm going to eat for lunch you know simple simple things like that we can start to cultivate and try to live in the present you will realize there's so much to learn just by being in the present yeah so then after which then we brought then it brings us to this conversation of the previous life of knowing again then it brings back to the point of being staying present yes um we might sometimes spiritually through our practice or sometimes people might not even be in that sense they just you know it just sort of like they get images of their of their previous life there are children in china or in other parts of the country whereby you know at a very tender age very young age and they said oh this is not where i belong I lived in this other town 
and my mom is this, this, this. My dad is home, home, home. And they actually brought the child to that village. And it was truly that way. But that's not going to change your present life. Your present life, the way you are, where you are right now, the life that you're living right now, is where you're supposed to go. Understanding your past life, it is kind of like a key to maybe some of the questions that you have. Why am I the way I am right now? Then when you get some a glimpse of your past life, you know, maybe in terms of the mystic world, it might answer you certain, you know, to it might give you answer to, to, you know, the questions that you have in your head. But that does not determine the life that you are living right now, your current life. If I talked about from my personal experience, I have a very clear picture of what my past life is. And that's how I accepted the title when people call me that or, you know, because I saw what I did, where I was, where I was born, who my parents were, my whole entire life from birth to death, you know, the whole entire journey. But it doesn't change the way I am right now. So what if I know? So, you know, okay, fine. Of course, when we talk about um, life after life, it is actually the continuous movement of the karmic energy, right? So you come into this life, you have like a package, a bundle of this, this, this karma that you brought forward, right? Karma, when we talk about that, is your actions of which whatever you do, you say, you think, it is all being registered. Is this a kind of energy? Then that is what that keeps this, you know, this life force going, this karmic energy. Then when you take rebirth, a portion of that will come with you. But what happened is that when that portion of that come with us, instead of finishing this, using this, this package of that, this energy, this karmic, you know, this package that we have, we are piling more. Through, of course, you know, and, and that is how it, it just keeps moving. We're piling more. Therefore, we have to be very careful on what we are piling on. In Mandarin, there is always this saying that um, they will, uh, how do I translate that into English? It is not that um, the karma is not ripen. It is about the time. When the time is up, nothing can stop that. Good or bad karma? When we talk about karma, I think a lot of people have the thinking that it is something negative. No, it is just your actions, whether it is good or bad. Yeah. So then, when people cling on so much to, oh, oh, my past life is such and such, they're living in this la-la land that is already over. If I were to keep thinking about my past life, I will think about how high and mighty I was. Right? I will just say, it, I was such and such. Of, um, of such an activity that I have, then I become very, if you are so stuck in that, then, you know, it could vary. vary. The, the mind is just so feeble in that sense that it just can be led very easily. So if I get stuck in that, then I would just say, oh, what's the use of me practicing? That was already so accomplished, right? Of course, then we, brought, we bring back to the topic of Rinpoche's and all that. They were, you know, the reincarnated enlightened beings. So what's the point of, I just need to sit here and look through my Facebook. I'm still enlightened. No, it doesn't work that way. It, is, it doesn't work that way. Of course, um, it might be faster in the sense of being in a path to accomplish certain things. But that path still needs to be walked. We still need to go through that path. And if you get so st stuck up in that moment, then it's going to hold you back here. And if I were to put it in, in real life, it's just like somebody who was, who was filthy rich before, a multi-billionaire. And then you go through bankruptcy. You're not able to go through life if you keep thinking about what you used to have the cars that I used to have, the mansion that I used to have. And if you're not seeing the way of your current situation right now and alter yourself to fit into that, then you're going to have a very miserable life. 
So if we talk about the past life, if you think about something wonderful, it can either lead you to be, you know, very arrogant and just feel that I don't need much work. Or if you think about something sad, then you keep tapping, oh, I think I'm so depressed, now I have depression, it must be due to my past life. No. Your current is your, is your current. You come with certain package, but how it is going to be like later is up to your own doing. I personally do not like to put much attention in future life, in which mm -hmm. I think um, a lot of people are doing. I need to hurry up and rush and do something because of this and that. No. Mm. If you are able to take care of your present life and be in the present in full awareness and act through your heart, cultivate a compassionate heart, what we call that the bodhicitta, is of course it's a path, it's, it's a journey. The rest will take care of itself. The future will take care of itself and your past doesn't matter. If, or if your past is of something very positive, then it acts as a push. You know it, okay, it acts as, mentally maybe it gives you a little boost, but that's about it. But if it's not something that is, that is positive, you don't have to dwell too much into that because where you are right now is now. You can't change that. If you are very skilled, you can visit your past, you can keep going back there, but it's not gonna change. When you come out of that meditative state, you are still here. The clock of this 2020 is still ticking, not in a few hundred years back. That has already passed. It's not gonna you know, move back that way. You can travel there. You can keep on revisiting there, but it's not gonna change the current situation. Yes. Yeah, so that's why um, knowing is fine, there is no need for grasping on that. Yes. That, is, that serves as an answer to your question or maybe answers to why you are the way you are. And that's about it. Just leave it there. It was there. Leave it there. Move on and focus on your present life. Yes. You are here. You don't need to look forward to that. You do, you know, you focus this the way you are right now and of whatever that you are doing, proceed with great patience and compassion, the future will take care of it by itself. Yeah. That way, you are living life brisk, you know, very like taking a stroll. You, all you, your only business in this life is to take care of this life, the current life, the way you are right now. Worrying too much of the future is anxiousness. Anxiety. Oh my goodness, I'm doing this. Oh, it's bad. Oh, my future life is going to be. All this anxiety will start to kick in. What for? You're putting this on yourself. Just be here. Be in the moment. And as long as whatever you're doing is out of compassion, that's all you need. Yeah. For people who are not non practitioner, speak with kindness, act with kindness, even though if it's not. You know, you are not naturally born that way. Fake it till you make it. I always <laughs> say that. It becomes a habit. Yeah, it becomes a habit. Instead of, you know, uh, if it, you're not naturally born this way, if you're always very grumpy and always a very angry person, but instead of going through life this way, fake it till you make it. You know, act with kindness. Eventually, it will become you. Something that you do again and again and again. Then it becomes a habit then it will just come out naturally. The change that goes through within you, you don't even see it. Mm. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's how I see that. Yeah, fascinating. And also I've met um, several people or heard several ideas about karma, which you mentioned. And it's mm -hmm. almost as if karma is like a fixed entity on its own when it's mm. actually more dynamic because mm. there are certain ways where it's all you, you know it's it's affecting with causes and conditions at the same time mm -hmm. and even though x y and z might have been accumulated but with mm -hmm. either with a certain view or with a certain kind of livelihood and certain practices things mm -hmm. are all changing and molding into other different causes and effects at the same time so mm -hmm. what i'm trying to say is some people think it's a it's almost like a solidified thing that oh, that they cannot change their karma, 
L maybe from past life or even past situations in this life that whether it's genetic, whether it is a certain kind of trauma or certain mm-hmm. kinds of uh, <clears throat> upbringing because their family is like this, they are like this. Now it's almost that it's unchangeable, it's deterministic, it is fatalistic. So this kind of um, you know, like a grasping onto to almost like like um, unchangeable self or like unchangeable mind is like, you know, I think uh, also very, very, can be very dangerous, isn't it? Because we do not really use this kind of free will in a sense of within our current conditions, this amount of free exertion of free will within the current conditions. Plus, we do not take full self-responsibility. Mm-hmm. Which is allowed to be swept away by ocean, ocean or yeah. samsara, right? And then, this <laughs> <laughs> very unfortunate, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Yes. So, would you have any kind of uh, this kind of advice, some kind of tips, some kind of sharing, some kind of techniques for certain people? Let's say they are very traumatized towards something from the past in this current lifetime, whether it's a kind of abuse, some kind of a trauma and all this, you know, everything. what would you actually say if somebody came to you with something about their childhood or their teenagehood? If we... You see, with things that is um, that has happened, if we talk about just a negative in which uh, is what you're pointing out, I always tell people that in order for a flower to bloom beautifully, you need tons of um, dirt. You slap some cow dungs on it. It doesn't matter how stinky it is it blooms even fuller. So the amount of, you know, dungs and all that that you put, it just bring out the flower and it just bloom. Likewise with life. Life is a journey. Sometimes we have wonderful things happening to us, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes when something that is negative that is happening to us is within our control, Sometimes it isn't. Whatever it is, it is not out of, it is not because of a lack of compassion that I'm saying this, but I think this is the fact. This is the, we can't change the fact that it has happened. We can't change the fact that it has passed. The only thing that is still staying on is the memory of that event or that situation. Now, if you keep dwelling in that event, and if you keep dwelling in that situation, it could be some abuse that, you know, that you experienced. Now, if you keep bringing back in and said, I had a traumatic childhood, I had a traumatic teenagehood, you are the one whom is constantly abusing yourself. The abuse, that act of abuse was long over. Back there, self victim. It has stopped. Mm. Yeah, it has stopped. But when you move on throughout your adulthood and you keep thinking about that, you are keeping the abuse going. That person has stopped. That event has stopped. You have taken over and you just keep doing that. Right? It is something that we can't change. There is no way you can go back in time like in a movie, and and undo everything. Therefore, my life is such, I accept it. You still have to live life, and you still have to move on. Life is about a journey, and that your experiences is what makes you who you are. Now, it's your choice to whether use that experience to your advantage or your disadvantage. Now, if you use it to your advantage, you emerge as someone of great strength. But of course, 
when you emerge out from your trauma or your past negative experiences in great strength, the tip that I would say is that once you have gotten that strength, pull yourself down a little bit, not towards there, but grounded. If you add the essence of compassion to that, the possibility is amazing, the outcome. But if you turn your trauma into a strength and you keep it so hard in that direction, there's always two directions to things. Strength, of, strength with softness, internal strength with compassion, or strength with greed, you know. I am not going to be brought down again then you're going to have a very difficult life after that because it becomes so hard, right? Use whatever that you experience that is of negative as, you know, and turn it into an energy to, that, you know, help build, you know, the way you are, the strength, learn about compassion, tap into that, it's fine. Now that it has happened to me, okay. If I keep thinking about that, I'm abusing myself again. I'm bringing that person back into my life and abuse it. The mind is amazing. That's why we have called, you know, we have this thing that's called imaginary world. Yeah. Only you can walk out of that situation yourself. No one can lead you out. So turn that into strength. Practice compassion. Be in the present, then your life will be, you know, the course that it will run. It will be smoother. Nobody knows what's going to come intersecting. Maybe certain events is going to happen and that it will bring back, you know, old memories. They will sometimes always say that. If it brings back, it brings back. In a sandstorm, you stay where you are. You take a blanket and you cover yourself. You just have to wait it out. You get all the sand and everything all over your blanket, but when you come out, it's finished, it's nice and peace. But when that sandstorm is there, you either run against it or you run towards it. You just, if you run against it, you're just going to tire yourself because you're not going to be able to outrun the sandstorm. You run towards it, of course, that's very stupid. Just be there, be in the present. Whatever has passed, has passed. Use that as an experience. I'm not telling you to forget about. Okay, so we have Kandruma back. Short technical <laughs> difficulty. Uh, so, yes, uh, where we were left off was the sandstorm analogy. Yes, um, so I think I finished talking about that. So, yeah, so with that, then, you know, when things are crazy, don't run away from that. Don't run towards that. Be there and just be, you know, how, how would I say that? It's not being passive, but just simply being. Of course, you will have all these crazy memories that's, that comes back from time to time. The more you try to run away, the more it's going to catch, try to catch up after you. And then running towards the sandstorm is just like you revisiting that again and abusing yourself. If it comes, let it be. Just like how when we are meditating, when we have a lot of thoughts that is clouding our mind, don't try to shut that thought off. The nature of the mind is as such. It's filled with thoughts. Because the mind is working, it's functioning. Like your nose, it is constantly breathing. Just because you have a blocked nose, you want to remove your nose? No. Right? Just because you have a ear infection, you want to remove the whole ear? No. The ear will still work as it is. So when you have the thought of, you know, the negative thought of the past, just, it comes. Just be with it and let it be. Let it run itself out. You, unless there's some, you know, some certain crazy uh, trauma, 
you're not going to be able to forget this. We don't erase things that has happened to us. It will be there, whether it is deeply reserved down, you know, your consciousness, subconsciousness, or, or it is very vivid up there. The memory will not be erased. So don't try to erase that. It is like you're trying to scoop out all the water from the ocean with a tiny cup. It's not going to happen. So just simply let it be. And then you learn from it. The memory is not a bad thing. It is there to remind you to not allow that to happen again. Of anything that is negative that happens to you, you don't have to take it to heart. Neither do you have to make yourself forget about that. It is there and it acts as a reminder. This has happened to me before. Now you learn to take precaution. You've been burned by the fire once. You don't quite remember. You try it again. You try again. You get really burnt really badly. That memory will not go away. But you know the next time when you see a fire, instantly you know what to do. So, yeah. Yes, this, you know, this idea of self-victimization. <clears throat> and also you mentioned about a fire. It got me thinking of this analogy of being shot at with poisonous arrows. Mm. The arrows land at your feet. You know, it lands on our feet, so it, it, it hasn't hit us. But what we take is we pick up, we see the poisonous arrows, and we stab ourselves. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> One yeah. of the teachers I was studying with in uh, Bodh Gaya mentioned this analogy, and mm -hmm. it's so true. Mm -hmm. Or some experiences, you know. And yes, I think also earlier you did mention about compassion also, and I wanted to also bring up the idea that um how are we doing for time first of all i think we have about like 10 minutes or so okay. we, yeah so i'll just mention this on compassion then we can slowly wrap up so the idea of you know the method and wisdom that compassion and um wisdom has has to go intertwined because some people who just think compassion alone is enough can suffer mm. from over exhaustion, from passion burnout, because the wisdom mm -hmm. of uh, suchness, the wisdom of seeing things as they are, um, you know, it's 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 not fully, it's it's not conscious at that point. Mm -hmm. And if we just based on the knowledge, um, just you know, whether it's just dry reading, um, even just wisdom on its own. Without compassion, it's like not having the fuel for the vehicle. Mm -hmm. How is the vehicle going to move? So it's like dry, it's like dormant. So, mm -hmm. I th so in, in my experience, I mean, not just from what has been taught, I think this two together is so important. The bodhicitta, which you did mention, mm -hmm. I think, earlier in this, you know, this altruistic enlightenment together with cultivating this uh, kind of vipassana, this analytical or seeing things as they are um, in suchness, you know, in shunyata. It's so vital to have this too. It's like exercising just your right arm and then your left arm. Mm. <laughs> mm -hmm. So yeah, this um, why I brought up also to bring it uh, what you mentioned of compassion, uh, just to tie it with uh, wisdom because uh, some people uh, when when I share some of these things, they kind the compassion side is something workable, the wisdom mm -hmm. of like study and it's not just like studying to in, in reading right in the Dharma, uh, there's a certain process of uh, sila samadhi prashna so it's studying its contemplation reflection and then there's meditation so and, and and even meditation and study is not just in a monastery it's not just with the books it's every moment of life is the practice mm. uh, yep. i i think it's and this is already such a big topic which can be done for another time of every moment in every everything is a devotion mm. and yeah so is 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 I can't emphasize how much these two ingredients are so important. Um, 
you know, I think some people who, who feel they do not have the capacity to cultivate wisdom, you know, and it's, oh, just compassion is enough. So it's so much, much more needed, especially in the dire situations which we have in various parts of the world and even the human condition, as you mentioned, dukkha, mm. you know, dissatisfaction or unsatisfactoriness or suffering. So yes, um, in, in order to wrap up this rare pleasure of human rebirth, you know, um, sometimes we take so much for granted. We lose this sense of gratitude or even acknowledging some of the gifts which we have. What are some things um, as a, you know, in, in, in order for, for all of us to use, you know, what are some kind of tips, advices, sharing you have in order to live with contentment with this kind of gratitude, appreciation? <clears throat> As I has mentioned, uh, living in the present is very important. <clears throat> if you are able to live in the present in full awareness, the future will take care of it on its own. And if you base your current life by always chasing after this compassionate acts and like you said you will tire yourself out you will exhaust yourself out of course having the wisdom of emptiness and not having the seed of compassion that's not going to work out having the heart of compassion and not having the wisdom of emptiness you're just going to exhaust yourself out so uh I think that in general practice, when we talk about attachment and we may, when we try to detach ourselves, when we try to let go of this, you know, the self clinging, etc., the compassion can stay, but it doesn't mean that you have to let go of your basic common sense of how to be a human being. Everyone is eager to help especially to those who has the idea that it will have some, you know, certain good effect on you or bring you good merits. But don't do it blindly. That's why it said, be in the present and be very aware and understand things. If you help, great, but don't help blindly. Understand it and not just, oh, yes, this donation is good. I'm just going to do that. Don't chase after things. When things come, it comes. And when it comes, apply common sense to that. Don't be blinded by, compassion is great, but if you take so much of that and you are blinded by that, it will go the other way. Like I said, everything has two ways. Things, you know, things such as compassion that is you know, of a very positive essence, that too has two ways to go. So you know, I think we just have to be, learn to balance yourself, don't go this way or that way. Just stay in the present. And that um, be mindful towards yourself. Once you are mindful towards how you are, the outside world, the materialistic world, it will come alive and you will see things differently. Yeah, so be compassionate, be patient, but don't do it blindly. Along with that, if you're not a Dharma practitioner, you know, to apply the, the wisdom of emptiness to that, you know, the understanding, maybe you have not realized the wisdom of emptiness, but the knowledge of emptiness, apply that together, it goes like this. But if you're not a Dharma practitioner, then have a, uh, you know, a general uh, moral common sense ethic in all that, together with compassion, then it will go hand in hand this way. Beautiful. <laughs> I could never have said it better. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, um, we've, you know, we just felt that the time has just flown by. <laughs> we've mm. just covered, <laughs> you know, I think <laughs> we covered just a, a little 
<laughs> I, I try not to because I know there is a time time constraint. Of course, you know when we go, yeah. there is every small little topic that they can really be elaborated very far. But yeah, yeah, especially with this uh, whole uh, precious human life as well. I mean, mm. you know, the idea of like being in a being in a land where the dharma is practiced, or you know, mm. this kind of endowments and all that. I mean, if we go deeper mm. into it, but. I think as it is, you know, it's a good session. I really hope that everyone found this useful. You know, it's a very, uh, it's a privilege to have Kandro Dawadrolma here. Kandro Ma, thank, thank you. you so much. And you so much. for all viewers, uh, in the description, um, I will include uh, the link to the Facebook page. Uh, okay. she, has, she has teachings there in English and in Mandarin. And... Mm -hmm. You know, there are com uh, there's a comment section there. If there are any queries, uh, I'm sure Kandroma would get back at some point. So once <laughs> again, uh, thank you, uh, Kandroma, for being so kind okay. and expounding this, uh, propounding this compassionate wisdom teachings. Very practical and very rational. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>